Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to part two of Eid al Adha. I carry on from what I said. I said, if you add something to the Quran that is not in the Quran, or you take away something that is in the Quran, away from the Quran, you have put yourself as a God. You decide what goes and what goes not in the Quran, and that is an act of association. And that Allah says that anyone who strays away from the Quran and follows other groups and is happy and all that kind of stuff, as far as Allah is concerned, is these people are mushriks. وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And do not be part of the mushriks. In another ayah, Allah, in the same context, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ as for those who have divided their religion, because Allah considers a religion is a set of laws in one book, and that book acts as the law. The highway code has one book. You don't have 600 books. In, in England, we have the highway book that is produced by the government. Other people explain, but as long as their explanation do not contradict what the government says in the highway book, all is good. Okay, but if the government says something in the highway book and then people, engineers or anyone, uh, no matter how PhD they are, if they say something that contradicts or adds to the highway code of the government or takes away from the highway code of the government, has associated with themselves, they have put themselves as another party with the government and that Allah doesn't accept. And so Allah says the Quran for him is one and the outcome of the Quran is al-Islam. Fine. And then Allah says, As for those who have divided their religion, instead of sticking the Quran, they divided the Quran with something else and they started following the other thing as well. And broke up into sects and parties and groups and denominations. Lasta minhum fi shay. You, Muhammad, or because Muhammad is not here with us, me, you, and everyone else, have nothing to do with them. In other words, if Rasulullah was alive with us today, we are on the 11th of June 2024. If the messenger of Allah was alive today, he would completely detach himself and disassociate himself from the Salafis, from the Wahhabis, from this, from that. To him, you follow the Quran, that's the religion of Allah. The Prophet will not come here and says, oh, that's my sunnah, let me follow it. No way, he will not. Allah has told him, you have nothing to do with them. Again, because Muhammad as a messenger follows the Quran and the Quran alone and that's the straight path. And then Allah says to Rasulullah, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ Indeed, their case rests with Allah. It's not up to us to judge people or kill people. I just do what I feel is the correct thing to do and let people to their God. And then Allah says, then Allah on judgment day will declare to them what they used to do in this life. And this is in Surah Al-An'am, Surah number 6, and the Ayah 159. However, we have four schools of thoughts. The huge number of different opinions of scholars that exist today, that have always existed today. Why do we have four schools of thoughts? The Quran is one. It's one straight path. We should have had the Quran, one school of thought. We follow the Quran and of it. Why did we end up so much so? And this is a talk that is on my YouTube channel where I put 12 centuries in less than an hour. At one point in our existence, we had in Mecca, in Mecca, Mecca is a, is a room. It has four sides, right? The, the one school of thought had their pulpit for the Imam to stand and do the khutbah and where he leads the Salat against one wall. On the other wall, however, there is also another mimbar, another pulpit, and where the Imam would give the khutbah and where they pray. On the third wall and the, on the fourth walls, we had four pulpits, four places for the Imam and congregations. Each congregation which follows a school of thought, the Maliki school of thought, would take wall A, for example. The Hanafi wall B, the Hanbali wall C, the Shafi wall D. And guess what? If I don't follow your school of thought, I don't pray behind your Imam. People used to hate each other. There have been assassinations, wars, even prohibition of marrying between a school of thought. And I'm talking to us Muslims. 
between the Shafi'i and the Hanafi just because of a stupid sentence. Stupid sentence. They stopped people and they lived and, and the misguidness is huge. The reason, the reason why we seem today all united, we're not all united, is because at one point Saudi Arabia invested billions upon billions to promote the Wahhabi, the Orthodox, the extreme Salafi views and the world became just a big part of Saudis. That's the reason why and Saudis started printing books and they started printing books that they are uh, for, the books that promote their ideologies and Muslims will follow that. But before that, it used to be a war. And now people are breaking away. Now, let me go to why the Hajj exists, the reason behind Hajj. Why has Allah prescribed Hajj not only on us, the believers? Hajj has been prescribed on every nation of a human being from here all the way to Adam. And if you go you, you'll say around the world, each nation have some form of pilgrims. You agree with them, you disagree with them, that's your point of view. But truth of the matter is, these people have a pilgrims, and they go too. You go, for example, in India, you've got the uh, Hare Krishna people, they perform some form of pilgrims. They go to some place and do some rituals. You, you go to Sikh, to the Hindus, everywhere around the world. Jews, Christians, everybody has that. So, it means we all share the root, right? We the believers who believe in the Quran, we believe that our version of Hajj is the authentic one. And of course we deem the other ones uh, as unauthentic because they should be doing what the Quran says. But what does our Quran say about Hajj? Right? Well, the idea of Hajj, the reason behind Hajj, goes all the way to the beginning of the humanity, the journey of humanity. You see, when Allah created Adam, and this talk, I will go back to it when I talk about the growth, the evolve, uh, evolvement of the human race from Adam and before until judgment day. But uh, for now, I can take an excerpt from that. When humanity started its journey in this life, we didn't have the knowledge to do everything, just like uh, 200 years ago, we didn't know how planes worked and we didn't know how submarines worked. With times, alhamdulillah, we managed to get there. But this knowledge of submarines and planes and trains and cars and bicycles and all that kind of stuff. You see, 40 years ago, we didn't think that cars would be electrics one day. And today, most many of them are fully electrical. So at one point in existence, humanity didn't know. Just like today, we don't know what 200 years from now will look like. But... When 200 years come, we find that we've discovered something. Sometimes I sit by myself, my sisters and my brothers, and I wonder and I mesmerize how did Henry Ford manage to build a car engine with the technology he had back then? How? Well, the truth of the matter, as Allah says in the Quran, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ He taught, he, he being Allah, taught man what man did not know. Surah number 96, ayah number 5. So Allah is behind us. Allah is behind. So Allah teaches us, but He teaches us indirectly. He doesn't feed us the information. He gives us the tools, points us, helps us, does this, that, until we get to where He wants us to go. Nuh, when he wanted to run away, when the punishment of Allah was coming, Nuh didn't know how to make a ship. So Allah sent Jibreel and sent angels to teach Nuh how to build a, a submersive uh, ship. And Nuh built it. So here Allah is behind the scenes. He teaches us. You see, when your child is, is born, let's say you just gave birth to your child. And two minutes, three minutes into his birth, the nurse check if the baby is fine, his ears open up, his nostrils open up, he breathes in, oxygen burns their lungs, he cries, fine. And then the child suddenly, without you doing anything, the mother puts the child to her chest and the baby starts feeding from her. Who taught the baby how to feed? He knows nothing. He knows absolutely, even pooping and peeping, 
pooping and peeping, <laughs> pooping, pooping, oh, uh, uh, going to the toilets from both hands, okay, peeing and pooping, yeah, there you go, peeing and pooping to the child, uh, he has no control over, and that's why sometimes you change in the nappy of your child, and the child decides to pee, woo, especially if it's a boy. And guess what? You end up with a shower and you didn't ask for it. Why? Because the child cannot control it. So who taught the child how to do Well, Allah. And Allah did mention this in the Quran. He mentioned the fact that he taught the baby how to breastfeed from his mom without us inputting anything. So Allah is behind the scenes helping us. At one point in existence, we humans were as is the case for anything else on earth today, we're looking to feed our hunger. Back in time, back in time, this, the, the natural selection between couples, man and woman, the woman would look to the man who is strong, who can go out and fight a tiger, fight a lion, fight a gazelle, runs faster than a cheetah to bring food at the end of the day to his wife and children. And the, and the man would look to the woman who is there to support him emotionally, to support him there, take care of the kids. So she's got a job to do, he's got a job to do, they do it. And life was going fine. The man defends, uh, is ready to die for his family, goes out there and it's his job to bring food. And that's why it's in our psyche. No matter what the feminists say. No matter, and I had so many endless uh, discussions with them, and most all the time when they reason were fine, I always win the argument. Deep inside a lady, she doesn't want a man who stays at home, a husband, and she goes to work and comes home and feeds him and the children. This is, it's so awkward. Why? Because the society, we are so used to, the man goes out there, works his but off to bring food at the end of the day and he comes home. When the wife sees her husband back home with all the food and things like that, she feels good. Everything is, seems to be running good. It's just the way we are. So in order for us, back in time, to secure food, we can't eat grass all the time. Humans have discovered that eating meat had protein in it, was a good sustenance. After all, they saw how lions feed on meat, they saw how uh, wolves eat meat, all animals eat all animals. And then they saw some animals, they eat grass and they don't eat meat. And the question comes in, why don't these people eat meat like the other ones? There are some birds don't uh, don't eat meat they eat grains like chicken but anyhow so it goes even chicken eat worms and things like that already so and allah here intervened man used to go out hunt and do all these things allah wanted to help man instead of man spending half of his life chasing and running and fighting and doing all these things allah is gonna make food come to man and that's what exactly allah did allah chose four or five categories of animals and turn them domesticated, docile, for man to have beside him. Those animals are horses, donkeys, camels, cows, sheep, goat, uh, some birds here and there. Uh, did I forget something? Yes. And this is what Allah called Al-An'am or Al-In'am. Al-An'am comes from the Na'ma, the Na'ma. The Na'ma is the gift from Allah, something that Allah gives to you. So cows at one point in their existence were wild. They used to kill. Donkeys at one point in their existence, they used to kill. Today zebras, you can't ride the zebra. Horses, if you leave them in the wilderness, they become wild. A sheep, if you leave him in the wilderness, he becomes really, really dangerous. All you gotta see, see all these goats that live in the wilderness. So what did Allah do? He tamed this cattle for us and gave us power and authority over them. And now you see a child of five years of age has a harness in his hand and is pulling a horse, a very big horse, and the horse follows peacefully. How did that happen? 
a child will not have a harness and pull a line like that. A line will make a fist out of child. Well, guess what? At one point, Allah changed the way these animals behaved with us. And from that time, they became at our service. And this, Allah made sure to mention it to us in the Quran. Allah states, وَالْأَنْعَامَ خَلَقَهَا لَكُمْ And the cattle, as I said, uh, cows, camels, sheep, and, uh, the, and goats, الْأَنْعَامَ He created them for you. So it's for us, yes. لَكُمْ فِيهَا دِفْءٌ In them, you find warmth, because once you eat the animal, you take the skin and you make a clothing with it. Fine. وَمَنَافِعُ And there are many benefits from them for you. Very nice. وَمِنْهَا تَأْكُلُونَ And from them, from this cattle, you eat. In another ayah, Allah even tells us how he made these animals at our service. He says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا Haven't they seen, don't they see? أَنَّا خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ and, and here seeing is about knowledge, yeah, it's not about seeing with the eyes, it's knowing. Don't they know that we have created for them from what our hands have made, i.e. Allah created these animals, these cattle, it's not us who made them, it's Allah who created that. So Allah created this animal and then what did he do? He tamed them for us. فَهُمْ لَهَا مَالِكُونَ After that, we are the owners of the animals. Subhanallah. Allah created the cattle, gave humans the power over these cattle, and then we own these cattle, we use these cattle, we benefit out of these cattle. A, a cow goes to the field, eats grass, and then at night gives us beautiful milk. How does that happen? How? How? You see what I mean? And then Allah says to us, وَذَلَّلْنَاهَا لَهُمْ And we subdued these animals, i.e. we tamed them. We made them not dangerous. They are not like lions and tigers. They are obedient to humans. فَمِنْ رَكُوبُهُمْ They can mount. We, of, of, of some of these animals, we can mount them. وَمِنْ يَأْكُلُونَ And these animals, we eat. And then Allah says, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ وَمَشَارِبُ And in these cattle, they have other benefits and drinks. We drink the milk. Don't humans, shouldn't humans be thankful to Allah for what he did to us? Of course it is. We must thank Allah and be recognized, recognized and have a recognition for Allah for what he has done for us. Right? So how do we do that? Well, before we slaughter any animal, we must mention and utter the name of Allah on that animal for two reasons. One, one, we are not allowed as a human beings to take the life of any creature that Allah created without his permission. When we mention the name of Allah, we kill. When you don't mention the name of Allah, you don't eat. I'll give you an example. Abdul Salam, I myself, I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah, you know, or you, or you take anyone, and we give him a knife, and we bring a chicken, and we tell him, please slaughter the chicken. That person, be a man or woman, the sex here is irrelevant. The sheikh or the lady takes the animal, and she goes, okay, and they mention the name of Allah, Allah. We don't have to say in the name of Allah or Allah Akbar. It's just we say Allah. We slaughter the animal. Everyone eats from the animal. Everyone is happy, right? Good. We take the same person. We give them the same knife and we bring a second chicken. But this time they don't utter the name of Allah. They, they keep quiet and they slaughter the animal. That animal is not halal. That chicken is not halal for us to eat. Nothing has changed. Only the name of Allah changed. The same thing. When we marry, why do we marry? It's because we pronounce the name of Allah on our marriage. So the children come into a husband, wife, of a good family. When we do not pronounce the name of Allah on a relationship between a couple, man and woman, guess what? They will live in sin. What makes Living in sin different than being husband and wife is the name of Allah being pronounced on the act. 
So here, Allah explains to us that He gave us the animals, He tamed the animals, He rendered them subdued for us, we eat from them, we drink from them, we make clothing from them, we, we benefit a lot of things from them. Then one way to recognize that is mention the name of Allah. And that's one of the reasons why if you don't mention the name of Allah, the animal is not halal. Because you've taken the life of someone you don't have the right to. Point number two. As a sign of recognition. You see, when you, when you slaughter an animal and you mention the name of Allah, it's individualistic. It's you. But as a nation as a nation of people, group of people, to be recognized and have recognition to Allah, then he appointed for us a matter, a hajj, a place we go to and collectively we offer a sacrifice. And this is what to us, the believers, is hajj. To the Jews, they have their own hajj. To the Christians, they have their own hajj. Of course, each people are different than others because people live in different places, different times, different situations, and so on and so forth. So Allah explains to us, I, I'm not going to read the Arabic because I, wanna, I don't want to make, uh, make it long, but I want to go back to Ibrahim because our hajj and that of the Jews and Christians go back to our father, Ibrahim. Uh, father here in, uh, in figurative sense, like uh, he, he triggered all this monotheistic uh, Islam. Allah says in the Quran, uh, in the translation of the meanings, and when we assigned to Ibrahim the placement of the house, at one point Allah wanted Ibrahim to build a house for him. So Allah showed where the house should be placed and he pointed out to Ibrahim. And then Allah orders Ibrahim, gives him a clear uh, instruction. Do not associate anything with me. When you do that, Ibrahim, build it for the sole purpose of Allah. I.e. do not build it in a manner for people because, oh, it's going to be easy for people. Let me build this one so that people do this. No. Exclude everything else. Build it as Allah intends it. Don't ask questions. Don't say. It. Just build it as it is. And then Allah says, And purify my house for those who will come and walk around the circumambulate and turn in it, circle in it. And then Allah says, And also purify it and clean it for people who stand in prayer or bow and prostrate themselves. And that's how we know that a salat should have part where you stand up, another one when you bow, and the other one when you prostrate. And I find it mesmerizing that people tell me uh, the Quran doesn't, ha doesn't show us how we pray. Well, Allah has just said, you stand, you bow, and you prostrate. What else do you want me to say? But anyhow. And then Allah says, when Ibrahim built the Kaaba, not as we have it today, but built the house of Allah back then. When he finished, Allah gave him an instruction, a very strange instruction. Allah says, and proclaim to the people the Hajj. I he called people to Hajj. Of course, people will tell you, uh, historians, of course, yeah, they will tell you there was nobody in the desert and Ibrahim was just yelling in the void. No, there were people there. But Ibrahim was talking to people. Allah uh, instructed Ibrahim to build a house to a people that already were living where Allah uh, instructed Ibrahim. But you know, so, and Allah tells Ibrahim and proclaim to the people the beginning of Hajj, the pilgrimage, and they will come to you on foot or on every means of their transportation, be that camel or anything else, and let them come from distant lands. Why? And then Allah explains the reason why Hajj got started in the first place, so that they witness benefits for them. I.e. people will come from different lands, different cultures, different business, different opportunities. They will all meet by the Hajj, by the house of Allah. And they will exchange what they've got and benefit from each other. And then Allah says, and mention the name of Allah. After all, they come into the house of Allah. It, it, it's just not right that they come there and they do nothing about Allah. So they mention the name of Allah on these appointed days when they come up to pilgrim to, to the house of Allah to meet with each other, benefit and do whatever. So on those days, 
They mention the name of Allah so that they don't forget Allah. Why? Why, yeah, Allah, did you want all this? He says, because, now, Allah is going to say why Hajj exists in the first place. Of the risk, the provision of the cattle. Allah has legislated Hajj in Islam for one thing and one thing only. is for us to be thankful for him to have given us the cattle. The animals we eat, we get our protein from. That's the only reason. And on top of that, we recognize Allah for what he has given us and everything. And then Allah says, therefore, eat from their meat and feed the desperately poor people. So this is the purpose of Hajj. For people from different nations, cultures to meet around the house of Allah. Learn to tolerate each other, do business with each other, marry from each other, inherit, do everything that people do when they meet together, and then glorify and mention the name of Allah in these days as a single unity of people who acknowledge that Allah has given us cattle on earth. And if Allah didn't give us these cattle, guess what? We all will die out of hunger. In other words, all the meat of the cattle has been made halal for us for that very purpose, the purpose of our existence. Bear in mind, lions, tigers, crocodiles, eagles, etc. aren't part of the cattle. And Allah as such has not made them halal for us to eat. Sorry, the, the police. And of course, Allah didn't make dead animals. So we eat from the meat that Allah has made halal for us. He said, of course, certain conditions. If the animal has been dead, we don't eat it because the name of Allah has, been, has not been pronounced on that animal. And it's going to harm us. Even if it died a second ago, we can't eat it. It's a soul that has gone without the mention of Allah. My sisters and my brothers, When Allah speaks about the dangers of associating other deities with him, he goes, he goes in all kinds of directions to explain to us, don't do it. It's not the fit. He has given us authority and power over certain things, but at the root, at the deep, at the depth of that, we must always go back to Allah. That's it. When, when people performed Hajj at the time of the Messenger, Nah. Allah stated that in this cattle لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعٌ إِلَىٰ أَجَلِ musamma, There are benefits for you in these animals until a specified term Specified time meaning the day when you are going to slaughter them Because once you slaughter the animals you're going to eat the animals and end of that But because of that you still can drink milk of them You still can mount them You can still do certain things And then Allah says ثُمَّ مَحِلُّهَا إِلَى الْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ Then all these animals should be driven to the ancient house, to the house of Allah, not far from the house of Allah. And that is when they should be slaughtered. And Allah says, and to every nation we made a hajj. Of course, ours is as it is today. But other nations, they also have their hajj. And then Allah says, لِيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنَامِ So that they commemorate and mention the name of Allah upon the cattle that Allah has tamed for us, has given to us. So your God is just one God, and to Him, surrender. You see, Allah spoke... When he spoke about certain characteristics which are needed when we perform Hajj, it's easy. You go Hajj, mention the name of Allah, do business with each other, the animals, you slaughter them in recognition of what Allah has given us, we go back home. But Hajj has been corrupted, has truly been corrupted, and why? It's because of politics. Allah explains in the Quran how we uh, slaughter the animals. He tells us, and we have made uh, either big animals, al buddhim from the camels and the cows and things like that, part of Allah's rituals for you. There is much good in them for you. So invoke the name of Allah over them as they are lined up for sacrifice. Then when they have fallen down dead, feed yourself from them and feed those who do not ask and those who ask. It is like that that we have subjugated them to you, i.e. made them submissive to you. Perhaps 
you would acknowledge that? Hajj is nothing but the recognition of what Allah has given us, the cattle. And that's why people might think, oh, Allah will benefit from the meat. Allah says, no, 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 no. Neither their meat nor blood reaches Allah. But it is rather your piety that reaches Him. Just like today when you mount... Every day when I go, when I travel, when I get on my tube or the, the train or the bus, when I sit down, I always make the dua, Subhanallah, sakhala, glory to Allah who has made this possible for us and we would never have reached that had he not taught us how this. I always do this because the train could never have been discovered if Allah didn't teach us how to do it. The same thing for animals. Animals are there every day at smaller level you, you slaughter an animal you mention the name of allah at the bigger uh, scale you go to a kaaba you still mention the name of allah you still slaughter the animal but it's just done at a bigger scale people today have added to hajj and corrupted the meaning to hajj beyond belief they linked it and with viciousness to the story of what took place between Ibrahim and his wife Hajar and their son Ismail. And that Ibrahim was going to slaughter his child and then Allah saved the child and ransomed him with the sheep or the ram. And instead of slaughtering and uh, murdering his child, Ibrahim murdered the animal. And that is why every year we do what we do because of that. When the Quran... If the Qur'an was a human being, he would get thirsty by screaming, No! Hajj is not because of Ibrahim. It is because of the cattle, of the meat that Allah has gifted to you. It's got nothing to do with Ibrahim. But the sheikhs every year invent story after story, tale after tale. Even when we go to Hajj today is corrupt. Do you know Hajj, the entire Hajj is, is, is given the explanation of Ibrahim. Yes, apart from turning around the Kaaba, As-Safa and Al-Marwa. Allah means something completely different. But they say As-Safa and Al-Marwa are two mountains where uh, the mother of Ismail used to run because her child was very thirsty and she was running like a crazy woman from a, a mountain to the other one, getting on the top of the mountain and seeing if she sees people. And it doesn't make sense. But today when we go to Hajj, we walk between these two with that intention. And they will remind you that they will tell you Hajar was here and she ran from this mountain to the other one. But Allah says, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. As safa wal marwata are two parts in Hajj of the rituals of Allah. Allah didn't mention Ibrahim, didn't mention Sarah, but they became part of that. Now in our psyche, we believe that the mother of Ismail ran between these two and she didn't. But hey, what do you want? In Hajj, we have Ramyu uh, al-Jamarat, the pebbling or the throwing of the stones. If you go on YouTube, you'll see people throwing the pebbles. Why? They will tell you, well, there is the small one, the middle, and the big one, yeah? And they will tell you, well, this is the three times when a shaitan appeared to Ibrahim to dissuade him from not uh, executing the order of Allah to slaughter his child. This is rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. But it's part of our Hajj. Even though Allah has rebuked people who wanted to add a little bit or to give their opinion in the religion of Allah. Allah told them, Allah bidinikum? Do you teach Allah about your religion and Allah knows what is in the heavens and what is on earth? Al-Islam is the religion of Allah. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the help of Allah and the victory come, and you see people entering in the religion of Allah. Not Allah and Muhammad. Not the Quran and the Sunnah. It's only the religion of Allah. There is no Allah. This Islam belongs to Islam. So now the question comes in. Where does Eid al-Adha come from then? Why is it every year we have the same issue? The farmers, they increase the prices of the animals. People struggle to buy the animals. If they can't afford, this, uh, afford the animal, the children will be heartbroken and people will point at them. <laughs> they broke, they can't afford the animal. Why? 
Well, the root really is far more disturbing. It really is. Because it goes to an ancient uh, conflict that took place between the Jews and us, the believers. The children of Israel and us, the believers. This argument comes from who the child that Ibrahim was going to slaughter. Was it Ishaq or Ismail? Was it Isaac or Ismail? The children of Israel, the Jews, hold that it was Ishaq, Isaac. We, the Muslims, the believers, we say it's Ismail. Today, on 2024, we say it's Ismail across the board. But at one point in our existence, in the third century, opinions of the scholars were split. Some of them said it was Ishaq. And some of them said Ismail. But as I said, the Saudis, when they got hold of uh, everything, they promoted that it's Ismail. They taught the Sheikh Ismail. And it is Ismail. Now, every year, and this is now when things start getting scary. Please pay attention. The children of Israel, the, the, the Hebrew and the Arabic, are very, very close to language. They're very, very close to each other. It's almost like the, the, the same family. All right. So the children of Israel each year they celebrate the new year like the Christians like the we everybody has a new year's eve and then you have the first day of the year. The Jewish call theirs Rosh Hashanah. And because the Jews don't have the s sound in their language they say Rosh which in Arabic is Ra'su Sana Ra'su Sana Rosh Hashanah Ra'su Sana. And in that festive Ras Sana meaning the head of the year. And the first day, that is their first day, the, the, all right, they have 10 days till another celebration called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the big day of repentance where according to Jewish traditions, Allah will forgive a huge amount of the Jews, but on one condition, the Jews that have given far and beyond themselves in the 10 days prior to the 10th day of Yom Kippur. All right? And now you will start seeing why we also have the 10 days of the Hijjah. The 10 days of the Hijjah are in answer to the 10 days of uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the head of the day, uh, the, the year, and the 10th day of uh, the Jewish calendar. So, in this one, in the Rosh Hashanah, is also tied in to another thing called the Akidah. Uh, which the Sarfi they will tell you the Aqidah, the Aqidah, the term Aqidah comes from the Jewish the word of Aqidah, the, the, the belief, where they, or, or they call it the binding of Ishaq. What it is, is this. They believe uh, that Ibra when Ibrahim wanted to slaughter his son Ishaq, that took year in the head of the year, like the Ras Hasana. And the two first day of this celebration, are related to Ishaq. And here on day one and day two of the new Hebrew year, they will observe fasting. And of course, fast is encouraged for the 10 days. If you want a maximum repentance, do maximum goods in those 10 days. Just like us, we do the 10 days of the Hijjah and Yom Arafah is the day when Allah forgives a lot of people and Allah will boost to the angels Allah comes down to the heavenly earth uh, skies and does this exactly like that it's the same copy that the Jews have they just took it and put it in our religion gave it different names and we ended up exactly two practices the same thing the Jews and uh, start the year with that we end our year with that the same thing so Ishaq, the, the binding of Ishaq is, uh, uh, as I will sh share with you later, is the, the whole incident of Ibrahim and Ishaq going to the slaughter thing and the, the, the angel come with the ram. Thing. So it's a ceremony. And in that ceremony, even when they blow the shofar, uh, which is the, the, the ram's horn, when they, they, they blow it, they blow it to as a reminder of Ishaq, how Ishaq was spared. Back in the days, the Jews would, each year, slaughter an animal uh, as a ransom uh, to always remember that Ishaq was spared. When Muslims in the 3rd century, 
And the Jews at that era used to compete and they used to fight with each other who the child was. The Jews saying it's Ishaq, the Muslims say it's Ismail. Each one of them created huge fe religious festivities around the event. The, the Jewish, they have the binding of Ishaq. They have the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Ten days leads you to Yom Kippur, the day of repentance and atonement and forgiveness. Muslims linked the ten days of the Hijjah to the slaughter day where uh, when we slaughter, we are celebrating that Ismail got spared because we did good deeds in the 10 days. We didn't cut our hair. We didn't cut our nails. We didn't do that. We get maximum rewards and Allah is going to spare us from our fire. Both the Jewish and Muslims share the same ideology for the same idiotic fight. I don't care who the child was. Ishaq or Ismail is not important. And the, the, the sacrifice is not what Allah wanted from Ibrahim. It's, it's a completely, for completely different reasons. So then again, the head of the year with the Jews begins, starts the 10 days of repentance until gets the Yom Kippur. The day, uh, also the day of atonement and forgiveness and things like that. For us Muslims, we have the beginning of the 10 days of the Hijjah to Arafah and uh, Arafah is the day where Allah will forgive our sins tons of people will, who are destined to have fire will not go to have fire and things like that if I lived 60 years at least one of them years uh, uh, I'm within the list come on especially if I do good and things like that right well the first 10 days my dear sisters and my brothers Eid al-Adha is nothing but a hoax played by our sheikhs to compete with the Jews. The Jews say it is Haq, our sheikhs they say it's Ismail. And that is the reason why. The other night as I was researching this topic, I actually put in the thoughts into paper, I, I, I came across an article written by a rabbi, a lady rabbi called Rachel uh, Berenbla. Berenbla, she is a Jewish uh, rabbi already. This is what she writes. She goes, this coming weekend, when my community will be observing the solemn yet joyful fast of Yom Kippur, because remember, if you fast Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the rewards are multi and Allah's uh, forgiveness to you is greater than ever. Is, is equal to the Yom Arafah. We have Yom Arafah, if was the day of Arafah, it atones the year before and the year after. Jewish, the same thing. She, she carries on. The Muslim community will be celebrating Eid al-Adha, the feast of the sacrifice. And then she says, and whatever she's going to say is the truth. She says, commemorating the story how Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son and God provided a sheep for the slaughter instead. Jewish readers may be nodding along in recognition because they recognize the same story. After all, we read that story just last week at Rosh Hashanah, like in the head of the year, in my community, uh, Rosh Hashanah, in my community, as in many communities, we read the story of the casting out of Hajar and Ismail, like how Sarah, the how uh, the, uh, this is me not talking, yeah, end of quote, Sarah kicked uh, Hajar, she told Ibrahim, get her out, because she's pregnant, get her out, right? All the story that you know about Hajar being taken to the Kaaba and left alone by Ibrahim and uh, she's left with Ismail in the desert. All this is in the Bible. It has nothing to do with us. And this is why this rabbi, Rabbi Rachel, commemorates this story. And she goes, this is the casting of Hagar and Ishmael on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. So Hajar and Ismail were cast out of the house of Ibrahim and Sarah on the day of Hashanah. And the story of the Akidah, i.e. the binding al-Aqidah, al al-Aqidah al is the, the knot of the binding of Ishaq on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Hajar and Ishmael got kicked on the day one of the head of the year. The story of Ishaq happened on day two. 
Of course, she goes, uh, Rabbi Karizon, of course, there are differences in how our two traditions have memorialized this shared story, how we memorized in our story. In the Torah, the son who was almost sacrificed is clearly named as Yitzhak, Isaac. In the Quran account, the son is not named, and that's true. Though there is a passage in which the son consents to what is to come, and this is what is Ibrahim says to his son, Oh, my son, I see in, in my dreams that I'm gonna slaughter you. And the child says, Yeah, my dad, see what you, you've been ordered. And then she gets, which becomes a model for the virtue and of gracefully acceding to God's will. In the class on Islam I took several years ago, I learned that our Muslims commentators on tafsir and, and scholars who thought that the son in question was Ishaq and others who thought that the son in question was Ishmael. Muslim traditions offer support for both viewpoints and this is also true. We can't seem to agree. And then she goes on and mentions certain names of scholars that are for Ishaq and other scholars that are for Ismail. While in the Jewish tradition, they only hold one. It's Ishaq. We are the ones who are split. If you go in Genesis, the book of Genesis, if you take any Bible that has the Old and the New Testament, and you go to chapter 22, you will hear the whole, you will read the whole story. It's about 15, 17, 18, no, I'm gonna, 18 verses. It tells the story, I will summarize it here, that uh, Allah orders Ibrahim to take Ishaq and go murder him, slaughter him. Why? Because as the Bible title says, Ibrahim tested. Allah wanted to test Ibrahim if Ibrahim is obedient or not. As if Allah doesn't know. Allah can't tell. It's, it makes my heart, my blood boil. But, so Allah wanted to test Ibrahim and he says, take your child and go. And Ibrahim, of course, goes on. And the, long story short, Ibrahim wanted to slaughter his child. And then Jibril comes in and he stops him. What are you doing? Don't do that. And the, the angel brings in a ram. Ibrahim sacrifices the ram and of it. The Jewish after that kept doing this tradition. These days they don't, you don't see it much, but it is still done around the world. Jewish still offer that offering at the head of the year. And that is where the binding, the aqidah, or the binding of Ishaq takes place every single big, if the Jews had a January, this would be the January 1st activity. And January 2nd activity, is remembering also Ishaq and they keep reading stories from the Bible, from the books about this event. And then another eight days to Yom Kippur, the day of forgiveness and things like that. So this is in chapter 22. However, if you, uh, and that is in, uh, in Genesis, in chapter 16 of the Bible, of the Old Testament, yeah, the title is Hagar and Ishmael, Hajar and Ismail. And they will tell you that Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, who had not bore him any children, and she, and because she had a slave girl called Hajar, and she named, uh, she offered her to Ibrahim for him to marry, perhaps he'll be more lucky with the girl and have a child, which indeed it, in fact, it happened. Ibrahim married the girl, the slave girl, and she bore him a child. And then they say that Hajar, felt like, oh my God, I, I, I am a mother of a child. And she started acting weirdly. And the, the, Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, became jealous. And then Sarah orders Ibrahim to take the girl and get out of my place. Ibrahim takes the child. Of course, the Ismail is born here. She takes the baby and Ibrahim takes them both and goes and leaves them in the desert from Palestine. They go all the way to Mecca and out in the wilderness, in the desert, nothing exists around there except sands. Ibrahim leaves the girl and her son and is about to come back. And our, our books here, not the Jews or Christians, our books, our books tell us that Hajar will run after Ibrahim. Who are you leaving us for, Ibrahim? And Ibrahim couldn't talk because why? 
he, it was heavy on him. He couldn't tell. And then she kept asking and Ibrahim. And then she told him, Ibrahim, are you leaving us here because Allah ordered you to? And he turns to her and he goes, yes. Then she goes, go away. Allah will not abandon us. All this is a pure lie. All this is a pure lie. Allah will not put the humans through this. Allah will not take a woman who has just given birth to a child, abandon her in a desert where there is no water, nothing. And then stories keep telling us that Hajar struggled and when the water had run out, food had run out and the child was crying and everything came. Uh, this, crushing down on her and, and then we have the story of uh, Ismail rubbing his foot little tiny baby foot on earth and then water sprang out of the desert out of the desert and then she became and she went and collected water she kept saying sim 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 and I stay in one place and that's how the word zam zam came in that's all this is nonsense but it's part of our culture 15 years of brainwashing they took Islam away from recognizing what Allah has done for humanity how Allah had turned meat for us to, to live on as opposed to us always hunting and all these things and they made it about a man murdering his child anything you know about Hajj is in the Quran Actually, if you go to Surah number 22, you will find a lot about what Allah wants from us in Hajj. You don't need to ask anyone. Just read that Surah. You understand what is that for you to do. Something I'm going to close the talk now because I'm coming to an, an end. I'm going to surprise you with another element. According to the sheikhs, because the Eid al-Adha was not known in al Madina, It was not. It is only linked later on when Hajj started. But prior to that, they didn't know when the Eid al-Adha was. Today it's linked closely to Hajj, and back in time they didn't know. Rasulullah made Hajj in the ten, uh, tenth year, in the year, just a few weeks, about 12 weeks before his death, he performed Hajj. So it's impossible for the Prophet Muhammad to have celebrated the Eid al-Adha. Impossible for him. Because for you to celebrate that, you need to meet, uh, to wait for the next year. And as such, cutting the nails, not cutting the hair, doing this and doing that, all these are man-invented things. In fact, they taken from the Judaism. Because always remember, the Jews uh, observe in the first 10 days of their first month of the year. And all is related to the binding of Ishaq, all the way to the big day of repentance, Yom Kippur, and the fasting on there, and the acts of charity, and the Jewish consider those 10 days the best 10 days in, uh, in Allah's sight. And we in our sight are the 10 days of the Al-Hijjah. As such, should you offer an animal? Well, you can offer that animal throughout the year in recognition to what Allah has given us. And of course, you can feed yourself as Allah said. You can donate to the poor, to the family, entirely up to you. But when Eid al-Adha comes in, this non-Islamic practice, this non-existing practice, do not slaughter a Qurbani or an Udhiyah for the sake of Eid. You will get no reward, A. Eh? On judgment day, when Allah asks you, when did you get that from? Where did I say that? You will not be able to answer. And that's very dangerous. Very dangerous. If you say the messenger, did you see the messenger do it? Did you see it? You're going to say, I heard. And Allah will tell you, wasn't it enough for you that I descended the Quran so that you went and heard? It's not enough. So, if you want to donate now, for because... On the other hand, it's, 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 it's painful. Because if you live in a Muslim country, say I, Abdul Salam, was living in a Muslim country. And uh, when Eid comes in, I don't buy animals for my children. Even though my children know that Eid is non-existent. Hey, they're going to have tons of problems with people on the streets. They're going to beat them up. They go, oh, all kinds of horrible things. And if I don't buy them an animals, my children will feel heartbroken. 
How come everyone is playing with them, uh, animal things like that? And I used to get cry when I was a little kid because people have their animal and we don't have ours. Why? Because my dad would bring it in the at night of the last day. That's when he brings it in. And we were very happy and we only had a few hours before the slaughter. From the very young age, the kids are exposed to blood and, and, and brutality. Uh, yes, adults, you, you slaughter the animal, you know what you're doing. But children from the young age watching these animals being murdered like that, it's created this sense of, of temper. And, and then they link it to Allah. If when you offer the animal, the first drop that falls from your, uh, from the animal sacrifice falls with Allah and all your sins are forgiven. Rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. Nothing of this. The only reason why we slaughter is, uh, uh, is when you go to Hajj. When you and I go to Hajj, there and then we slaughter the animal in recognition and why is it done by the Kaaba it really is simple Kaaba is the symbol of our spiritual feeding we feed out of the Kaaba the existence that represents that links us to Allah when we see the Kaaba we remember Allah we remember Islam we remember the Quran we, we, we remember right when we slaughter animals there it also is the symbol of our feeding in this life we eat of the meat. These two together in the pilgrimage should make us strong people always tied with Allah. So we get our spiritual feeding, we get our physical feeding. Both of them are there. We slaughter, we turn around the Kaaba, we, uh, we stand in Salat, we pray, we do everything we need to do. Problem with us today is... Al-Islam has been so much corrupted that when you tell people there is no Eid al-Adha, carry on you living your life, Arafah is non-existence, it's just for the Hajj. Everything that Allah mentions is the special reward for the people in Hajj. The rest of the Muslim world should have carried on their life as normal. But the sheikhs, doesn't sit, this doesn't sit well with them because we are competing against the Jews on one stupid issue who the child was. Was it Ishaq or Ismail? It's so stupid that Allah didn't even care to mention it in the Quran. If it was, in, look, Allah taught us how to say Salamu Alaikum when we enter our own home. Do you think Allah wouldn't teach us who the child was if it was important? But that's our problem today. When we strayed away from the straight path, we all fell in the water of corruption. The straight path is that single line bridge on a water. And in the moment you put your foot out of that straight path, you fall in the water. And this is what the Quran, Allah has defined the Quran many times as the straight path. In Al-Fatiha, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. What is the straight path? Al-Quran. Al-Quran. Guide us to what is inside the Quran so that we understand it. We apply it. We practice it. Eid al-Adha doesn't exist in the Quran. The sheikhs take an ayah, twist its arm until it sings rock and roll. Not with the Quran. It sings rock and roll. It starts rapping. Why? Because they twist and manifest. Them. I've had this conversation with sheikhs. And one of them told me, Ya Abba Hanifa, what is it that we can do today? It's, the, he goes, the, 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 the thing is already so widely spread. No one's going to believe us. And I told him, if we start today, in 15 centuries from now, people will believe us. The Quran will come back as the sole and unique driver of this beautiful religion. So again, to recap, we have nothing to do with Eid al-Adha. Sadly, at, at, at a bigger scale, people expect people are people, people, people. And the sad news, instead of just spending money on poor people in Eid al-Adha, we should care about them throughout the year. But we don't do that. So please keep your money in your pocket. If you want to buy an animal, buy it just because it's an animal. Explain to your children that Eid al-Adha has nothing to do with Ibrahim and Ishaq and Ismail. That Hajj has everything to do about the recognition of Allah's help to humanity. And have a wonderful life. I pray to Allah this talk... Uh, has answered your questions uh, so no, no need uh, to, to worry about uh, not cutting the hair or doing this or doing that really don't do that at all it's just simple as it is 
Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Kenya, brother Abdus Salam. Salam alaikum.